says, this is a video. <coughs> Sorry, excuse me, what's that? No problem. No. Uh. <coughs> Suggesting this means COVID is fake. COVID better be fake. We all gonna get it from this man. Cover your damn mouth. <coughs> Mr. Jones, did you know that 12 days ago, your attorneys messed up and sent me an entire digital copy of your entire cell phone with every text message you've sent. Oh shit, dog! they got your whole phone. And when informed, did not take any steps to identify it as privileged or protect it in any way. And that is how I know you lied to me. Bitch, is over. See, I told you the truth. This is your Perry Mason moment. Perry Mason? Nah, dog. this is more like Matlock, because you about to get Matlocked up. Oh. Look at that sweat. You going to jail. See how tight to make these handcuffs. You got bloated wrists, so I might have to just make you a one-click. I hope it's whiskey in there, but that boy need a drink. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Get you another drink. You gonna need two drinks. That better not be water. You need vodka. This is a vodka day for you. I'm not a tech guy. I told you I gave in my testimony the phone to the lawyers before or whatever, and, and so you got my phone, but we didn't give it to you. Matter of fact, let me just delete everything off my phone right now so I don't get law and order and CSI and matlock like your dumb ass. Good evening, black people, African Americans, and the new and improved brown m and I'm coming to you from one of the blackest locations in America, on top of one of those houses from the Super Bowl halftime show. As I speak to you, Snoop Dogg is 12 feet below me, high as hell, no idea that the Super Bowl ended two, three weeks ago. But tonight, black people, we are gathered to once again ask ourselves the question, where we is? The past year, it's been an interesting one for our community. Mm -hmm. Black people got a lot of what we've been fighting for, just not in the way we had hoped. New York City's got a black mayor, but he's a cop. Black athletes made history, but it was at the Winter Olympics. I don't know how to do none of that shit. Black people got out of prison, but one of them was Bill Cosby. It's the last time black folks make a wish with an evil genie coming out of a bottle of vodka. Lesson learned. Now, of course, 2020 was the year of black progress, which meant 2021 was the year of white people freaking out about black progress. White people spent the last year furious at the idea that their children might have to learn that racism exists and voting rights are disappearing around the country and they're not going to be easy to restore. We may need to get whoever brought back LeBron's hair to lead the fight. But black folks have also seen our fair share of triumphs over the past year. Obama's white friend turned Juneteenth into a national holiday. That's right. No more faking sick to celebrate Juneteenth. You walk in that job and you look your white supervisor in the face and you say, slavery! You hit the door. From now on, faking sick is just for the days that I'm hung over. So for that, we say thank you, President Biden, and also Vice President Harris, if we can find her. She's kind of doing a Frank Ocean, Kendrick Lamar, lay low thing, but we only hear from her once or twice a year. Respect, Queen. 2021 also saw black folk make progress in non-traditional black spaces, like spelling bees. Over the summer, Zaila Avant-Garde became the first African-American to ever win the spelling bee, which I think is G-R-A-T-E. Black people also took time to get our minds right this year because being black can be taxing on your mental health constantly got to be thinking about racism or whether or not they're going to reboot Martin. That's why Naomi Osaka and Simone Biles made headlines when they took a step back from their sports to take care of their mental health. Black athletes appreciated Osaka and Biles setting an example for them, and the white athletes who were competing against Osaka and Biles appreciated the chance to win for a change. But enough about the past, because we are here to talk about the future and the future looks bright for black America. In the entertainment world, we're gonna get a new Jordan Peele movie, a Black Panther sequel, and a Beyonce album is slated. I can't think of a better way to pass the time in an eight hour voting line at midterms. In politics, a black woman is likely to become a Supreme Court justice for the first time in history, making her the most powerful black judge in the nation, right behind Judge Mathis and Lauren Lake. And there's a whole new generation of black excellence on its way. Meghan Markle had a baby. Little Nas X is Little Nas X is due any day now. And Rihanna is pregnant. The only way this could be better is if Rihanna's baby is born holding her new album. So black people, 
when you ask the question, where we is, I say to you, we are on our way to a year of success, excellence, and reaching our full potential as a people. <laughs> unless, hang on, unless, unless there's a new COVID variant. In that case, stay your ass inside and watch the new season of Atlanta. God bless you, God bless black people, and God bless Nicki Minaj's cousin's swollen balls. I say good evening. Play me out, Dre. According to the latest census, the white population is decreasing nationwide. For the first time, the white population in the United States has declined. But there's one place their numbers are up almost 9%, Brooklyn. This wealthy white migration has led to increases in rent, cost of living, and requests to speak to the manager. So I followed a trail of succulents and Wes Anderson DVDs deep into the den of gentrifying Brooklyn, where I sat down with Tommy Holly. The white population has gone up almost 9%. The black population has gone down almost 9%. Would it be safe to say that that's how they're showing Black Lives Matter? By just moving them out to somewhere else? What they're doing is they're just buying out and cleaning out a neighborhood, and, and it's not right. Tommy's lived in Brooklyn his entire life. Everything is going up sky high, and it's harder to live. So the way out is to sell the house. Tommy's mother bought their brownstone in 1963 when black home ownership in Brooklyn was booming. But lately, black mortgages have been going the way of the dodo bird. We have the, you know, the white population that's moving in, and they walk up and down the street. Some speak, others walk past you like, uh, why are you here? But you got the stick, man. Yeah, but if don't, it, they don't think you like a magical Negro? Yeah, look well. At this, look at it, that's one of the magical Negro sticks. Okay, you just gotta go. <laughs> that scared gentrifies. A black dude with a magic stick? But no amount of black wizardry could make the block parties lit again. And residents like Judith Lavelle and Ayanna Prescott don't even recognize their own neighborhood. So this neighborhood used to be black. All black, 100%. Like the 70s black, like when right. the music was good and O.J. Simpson was just a really good football player. It was all black and you had discount that. stores where we could get things cheaply. We don't have that anymore. Yeah, our bodega is now a nail, like a high-end nail salon. What new milks have arrived? Oh my gosh, show? there's so much. There's <laughs> hemp, there's oat, there's um, hazelnut, there's coconut. The Trojan horse of gentrification oh, seemed to increase the volume of nut milks while decreasing actual necessary food supply. And even common decency was facing extinction. I've had uh, neighbors call 311. 311 is a hotline New Yorkers use to complain about non-emergency shit. And the gentrifiers seem to have it on speed dial. Hey. So um, 311 is like the snitch line, but the police don't come right away. Right. Exactly. So it's like the dry snitch line. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Couldn't you ring my bell? Introduce yourself. Come up, say hello. So are these just people that don't know how to make friends? Or is there an other of issue of that? Possibly. There's an anthropological term for this. Racism! And the only thing rising faster than the number of man buns is the real estate. The prices are just skyrocketing. The houses are going for three million. Before- Wait, I'm sorry, what'd you say? The houses in the uh, best I go for three million now. Three million dollars. How much you pay for this house? 23 seven. $23,000. And you can sell it right now? For close to two million. Oh, you got to go. Wait a minute, you the one that said that was your stay. Well, I did that before you told me what you was getting. <laughs> you know, the money is, is great, but it's not everything. Right, right. It's about the community. And if we're going to save that, we need to set some ground rules. What are some things that people moving into the neighborhood could do to help honor what has been built over the decades? Just be kind. Wait, just be, be kind? Yeah, just be kind. Okay, okay, I'm going to write that one down. Just be kind. <laughs> kind. Communication. Communication. Don't call 311. Don't snitch. Support the local small owned businesses. The local weed dealers. If that's your thing, yes. Definitely introduce yourself to your neighbors. Like I said, embracing what was already here. Don't just think that because you're here, you're entitled to your $9 artisanal coffee. Artisanal coffee? Mm -hmm. Arabica beans from Kenya 
or that's um, wild. Yes, is that where your coffee came from? Got this from a bodega. No, you said that. That's not a bodega cup. It is good. <laughs> all right? Damn, even I need caffeine. I gotta get the word out. And the only way to do that is in the universal language of Brooklyn. The flyer. Get out a look. Oh, Tell me what you I'm think. I'm making these flyers. Tell me if that checks out. You know, do respect the culture of the block, which means clap on beat. Clap on the twos and fours, <laughs> that's, that's good. Big. Oh I my like, God. I think yeah, yeah. You gotta be on beat. You can't have a block party if everybody else beat. You can't, you can't. This one, don't start a sentence with when I was at NYU. Just put these up, put them all around. Get the street okay. team together. Thank yes, you. Yes, sir. All right. All right. The community approved the gentrifier, but would it work? So would you consider yourself a gentrifier? I don't know, I've never really thought of it before. Do you speak to your neighbors? One of them, one time, just like ran into each other in the hallway. Damn, this man needs an education. We're trying to spread the word on ways we can help gentrifiers. I could flyer the whole town, but would it make people respect their black neighbors? Would it stop the 311 calls? The dog shit everywhere. Wait, should I say dog shit or dog poop? Dog shit, for sure. Can anything I do make a difference? Just tell me what you think of some of these ideas. Um, no phones for Karens. 311 for murder only. Mm -hmm. Contribute. Give the closest black person to you $50. I don't carry cash on me. I'll shoot you my Venmo. You ready? S scan that. All right. All right, I got it. Boom. Appreciate that. Thank you. Damn, flyering does work. But is it enough to stop the erosion of this historic community and hold on to legacy residents like Tommy? I'm going to Florida. The f you going to Florida? I'm tired of the snow. I'm tired of shoveling the snow. I'm tired of the leaves. Are you tired of racism? Yes, I am. You don't go to Florida? Oh, shit. I'm sorry for cussing. It's OK. Listen, I told you, you're not going to let me see my kids, but I'm not going to send you no money. Ah, welcome to CP time, the only show it's for the culture. Today, we will be discussing black animators. We're in a golden age of black animation right now, with animators such as Aaron Magruder of the Boondocks, or Peter Ramsey, who won an Oscar for that movie about that teenage black boy that was Spider-Man. I tell you what, if I had jumping powers, I wouldn't be doing no favors around the neighborhood solving murders for free. I'd be making millions in the NBA. Shoot a three-point on me if you want, Steph Curry. I'll snatch it out the air. <laughs> Turn over. But before those animators, there were pioneers who led the way in animation. Black pioneers like Zelda Jackie Orms. She created four comic strips, the most iconic being Patty Joe and Ginger, which starred two black sisters. They were the Venus and Serena Williams of their time, except for not playing tennis and not being real. So I suppose they were nothing like Venus and Serena. But aside from that, they were. This cartoon was so popular, it led to the creation of the first African-American doll based on a comic character. And it was the only doll with a face that said, I know these white girls are about to touch my hair. The next black animator we want to celebrate is Floyd Norman. He was hired by Walt Disney Studios after only two years in art school. And he worked on Sleeping Beauty, 101 Dalmatians, The Sword and the Stone, and Mary Poppins. Basically, if your mother ever bought you one of those fancy Disney VHS tapes, odds are Floyd Norman drew it. And you'd think he was busy enough working on those movies, but no. Floyd was also finding time to post gag drawings all over the Walt Disney campus. These drawings poke fun at company executives. When Walt Disney himself saw them, he was so impressed that he handpicked Norman to work on the Jungle Book. You know how good you got to be at your job where roasting your boss gets you a promotion. It usually only happens on Wild and Out. Norman left Disney to co-create the company Vignette Films, which is where he made his biggest contribution to the culture creating the original opening credits for Soul Train. 
It looks like if Thomas the Tank Engine did acid and had a couple shots of Hennessy. Finally, we must mention Bruce W. Smith, who directed the 1992 cult classic, Bebe's Kids. Wait a minute. This guy looks familiar. Look, can I... Stole my look. I have to talk to my lawyers about that. Anyway, Smith was instrumental in animating movies like Who Framed Roger Rabbit, Tarzan, a goofy movie. And not only did he create The Proud Family, which was Disney's first animated show with a black female lead, he was also a supervising animator on Disney's The Princess and the Frog, which featured the studio's first black princess. And yes, I know she was immediately turned into a frog, but it was still a better royal experience than the one Meghan Markle had. His crowning moment was co-directing the movie Hair Love. And I'm very happy that this story got told because it introduced America to every black father's worst nightmare, having to style your daughter's hair. The one time I tried, I messed up my daughter's hair so bad, she got a restraining order against me. I'm legally not allowed within 50 feet of her edges at all times. So there you have it. Some of history's most inspiring black animators. In fact, it inspired me so much that I commissioned a group of top animators to turn me into my unique animated form. Let's see how they did. <gasps> I knew it. I knew the guy from Bebe's Kid stole my look. Or did I steal his look? Well, that's all the time we have for today. I'm Roy Wood Jr. And this has been CP Time. And remember, before the culture, no, but seriously, am I a ripoff of the guy from Bebe's Kids? Be honest with me. Do I look like Robin Harris? The House Committee investigating the January 6th attack argues that former President Trump and members of his campaign were part of a criminal conspiracy to overturn the 2020 election results. He has not been charged with any crime. The Attorney General has been reluctant to appear partisan. Despite overwhelming evidence, Merrick Garland has yet to charge Donald Trump for any crime. It raises an uncomfortable question. Does the Attorney General not know how to indict someone? It's this week on Unsolved Mysteries, MAGA Edition. We've all watched as Donald Trump has committed a litany of crimes, inciting an insurrection, obstruction of justice, wearing black pants with a Navy suit. It has much of the country wondering. When Merrick Garland was in law school, did he skip the day where you learned how to do indictments? It is a mystery that has baffled legal commentators. Three different federal judges have criticized DOJ for being, quote, schizophrenic, for taking a, quote, bafflingly lenient approach. Meanwhile, new potential indictments continue to stream in like oath keepers into Nancy Pelosi's office. It is definitely a potential crime to remove classified information and handle it improperly. Trying to intimidate election officials and interfere in election results. Obstructing an official proceeding, namely the counting of the electoral votes on January 6th, conspiracy to defraud the federal government, and fraud. What? In indictable? That's indictable. Is indictable a word? Because I'm calling it. Rudy Giuliani allegedly orchestrating a scheme to push fake electors and forged documents. It was actually part of a very coordinated plan by Donald Trump and his allies. They knew full well these documents were not legitimate. Come on, man! They out here arresting people for jaywalking. This man incites a whole ass riot and he living it up at Mar-a-Lago eating prime rib buffet. Let him stay at Mar-a-Lago. Just drop some bars around the building and call that shit a prison. It ain't that hard. Why hasn't Merrick Garland indicted Donald Trump? Did he lose the big red indict button that attorney generals get on their first day? Did he sprain his indicting finger? Or perhaps, has Donald Trump just actually done nothing illegal? <laughs> <laughs> Nothing illegal, cool, man. That's funny. If you have any idea whether Merrick Garland knows how to indict someone, please contact the Department of Justice. Or hell, just contact Judge Steve Harvey or Judge Maybelline or 
Just anybody with a law degree, man. How is that boy still eating shrimp cocktails down in Florida, man? Oh, damn, I done stepped in another fish. Clean up this dock. Y'all done messed up my Jordans. I'm Roy Wood Jr. And every week I shine a light on black entrepreneurs changing the game. From app developers to the DVD man who somehow already has his hands on John Wick 7. If you're black, we're in business. Right on, people, and welcome to Black in Business. This week, I'm betting it all on a sector that's experienced incredible growth in my house this year, breakfast cereal. We all know the big players, Tony the Tigers, the leprechaun that steals from white kids, and the rabbit that also steals from white kids. But ain't none of them cereals black. Unless you count the Raisin Bran box, which, I mean, just kind of feels black. But now, there's a new face in the cereal bowl. I sat down with Nick King, a man who's introduced a cereal that's in the shape of a black power fist. He is truly putting black in business. Nick King, much respect to your brother. You are basically the Jackie Robinson of breakfast cereals. Should have called them things 42s. The, the biggest piece for me is how important it is for black kids to see themselves in a positive light. You know, mm. but breakfast cereal, a space that has never been infiltrated. So uh, I just wanted to be the change. Well, you got a good product. I can't wait to see these fists. Man, these is kibbles. I know kibbles when I say this is cat food. This is supposed to be fists. Yeah, actually, uh, it's uh, no longer, unfortunately, empowerment fists. Uh, we've gone through multiple different manufacturing companies that, that said the shape of the cereal is too complex. Hang on, hang on. They, they said it was too complex? They got, they got cinnamon toast shape, they got honey smack frog turds, but you can't make this? We're dealing with a 100-year-old industry, and because we didn't want to slow up the company any further, we have transitioned to regular circular puffs. What about the kids? What do the kids say? Have they tasted it? Kids have 100% given their approval. What kids? What kids? Oh, you kids. My son is my first original taste tester. Oh. Uh, he's now 15. Oh, he don't count. That's your son. You'll kick him out the house. You know what? You know what I'm gonna do for you, bro? I'm gonna do a taste test with kids you don't know. I, I accept that challenge. Mm-hmm. Hello, panel. First off, thank you for taking the time to appear on Black and Business. I know you all have a heart out right before bedtime. So let's get right to it. Now, have any of you all seen any cereal with black people on the box before? No. Um, I've only seen that raisin, raisin cereal that has that sun on it. See? Told you that shit was black. That's a smart one right there. So, Bailey, you've tried the cereal. Give us your analysis. I like it about the cereal because it's crunchy. Is this cereal for black people? Just saying. I'm not trying to make anything offensive, but just saying. That's a very fair question. This cereal is created by a black person. So in knowing that, how would you feel if you saw one of your white friends eating a black-owned cereal? The only, the only white person I know is my girlfriend. <laughs> okay. Well, that was unexpected. But an answer nonetheless. Continuing on. What would make this cereal an even better investment? If the cereal pieces look more like this. Okay. Raise your spoon if you're also disappointed that the cereal is not shaped like a fist. So you all are saying the cereal itself just needs to live up to the radical message that's on the box. Excuse me a second, that's, that's a good idea, good idea. All right, Nick, good news. I spoke with children not related to you and they all thought the cereal tasted great. I told you they would. Mm -hmm. Now, there was one thing that the kids were a little disappointed on and that's that the cereal was not shaped like a fist. Now, I know you have explained why the cereal can't be a fist, but in the meantime, Nick, you got to lean into the cereal being black. In fact, you need to make it blacker. Uh, I'm a little nervous about it, man, but go, go ahead, Roy. Here's a black-ass cereal I know you will go hard for. Fred Flakes. Now, Nick, don't go nodding your head, Nick. What better spokesperson for cereal than the chairman of the Illinois Black Panther Party, Fred Hampton? The dude who played Fred Hampton. What, what, what else do you have, bro? Okay, okay. Now, what about this one? I got a cereal for black people that they can enjoy with their white girlfriends. Ally O's. No, that too far. Too far. That's Ally O's. I recognize my privilege. No, you don't say it like that. You say it like Tony the Tiger. I recognize my privilege. 
the slogan. You got to say it like that. I'm, I'm gonna be honest, bro. I didn't. I didn't want to ruin this for you. Your creativity was good. I didn't want to kill it. But at the end of the day, I want kids to be able to sit at a table and see themselves, see positive black representation on a cereal box, and that's the idea. That's why I built Proud Puffs. You know what, Nick King? I respect your vision, and I'm gonna change your life right now by investing in your cereal. I'm gonna make your dreams come true. Now, how much money do you need for an initial investment? I would say uh, any anywhere upwards to uh, 300K. Oh. Somewhere around there, ballpark. Yeah, damn, I do not have that kind of money. Which is why I'll see you next episode where I'll be examining another breakfast industry, toast. That's one I could afford, I think that could work. We got English muffin, we got wheat, we got white, we got multigrain, we got three ghost worms.